and uh, with your media ministries. Um, last time I was here, really, in the, t- in the city, in the town, I don't know if you call this a city, a lot of the people that I knew that were here working, now they have buildings named after them, which means I must be old. So I went over to the place I was staying, and there was Morgan Hall. That's named after Clyde Morgan, who was the head of Adventist Frontier Missions. And they were just starting Adventist Frontier Missions when I was going to the seminary and sending people out. So now there's halls named after them, <laughs> which is great. Um, and then one of your old youth pastors from this church was David Shin. How many of you know David Shin? I think he's on 3ABN. Anyway, he now works out at Weimar. He's a teacher in our theology program. And so coming back here, I graduated from this place two times, and I see some of my classmates here. Actually, my old RA, Barry, is here. He could tell you stories about uh, the post-traumatic stress he went through having me on his floor. Um, But... (laughs) It's good to see you, Barry. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you today that we can talk a little about total community involvement. And uh, bless us to that end. Bless the seminar and the, uh, concerning the right arm of the gospel. In Christ's name, amen. Now, you know, I, I noticed here that they gave me quite a bit of time. This is a lot of time. Um, so I don't want you to fall asleep. So I probably will ask you some questions um, as well, just to keep you awake. How many of you have ever heard of Weimar? Okay, where is it? It's actually in in Germany, but um, if you've heard of the one in California, Weimar. And you know how it got its name, right? There was a um, German at the post office, and... The town was actually named after an Indian chief whose name was Wimeh. Wimeh was a person who was, knew all the, Engl- all the Indian languages of the subculture there. And during the gold rush in 1849, which is our, our football team is named after them now, the, 18, the 49ers, uh, gold was discovered about 17 miles from where our campus is. And, of course, there was a genocide of the Indians when all the others came in and got the gold. But this guy was kind of like um, a person that could talk to all the tribes as well as the folks there, and so he was revered. But the German didn't know how to say his name. He said, Wimme, Wimme, no, Weimar. And they changed the name to, to, to Weimar because of a strong German. How many of you know anybody who's a strong German? Okay, very strong personality. And so this is the name Weimar. Now, Weimar was a tuberculosis sanatorium. We heard about sanitarium work today, but a sanatorium was dealing with um, tuberculosis. When Kellogg coined the term sanitarium, he changed it from sanatorium because all of them were sanatoriums. And there were all kinds of sanatoriums that were serving the community, the public, and the number one cause of death back then was consumption. And consumption was a pulmonology issue where all of the lungs were um, sloughing off internally because of the tuberculous bacilli. Is it a bacilli? And this was causing all kinds of problems, and they had surgeries and different things they had to do. So this particular tuberculosis sanatorium was well known, and it served 26 different counties. 26 counties came there, and it was quite a huge operation, maybe serving um, so over 1,000 tuberculosis patients at a time, and they have even now there several cemeteries, which I show the new students that, you know, just in case things don't go well, we do have a cemetery. Um, so, <laughs> uh, and a lot of history there, a lot of very interesting people grew up there. Remember this guy Karate Kid in the movie Karate Kid, you know? He grew up there. Ben Nighthorse Campbell, who was the governor in Colorado, he grew up there. Um, and a lot of history. Actually, Ruth Graham, after the place shut down, it turned into a Vietnamese refugee camp in the 70s. And Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife, 
came and turned that entire camp into a refugee camp for the Vietnamese. And when they were there, there was an actor who came, an actress whose name was Tippi Hedren. And Tippi Hedren was of the Hitchcock movies. And she came, and she had these beautiful nails. And they loved her nails, and they said, show us how you do your nails. And now the rest is history. Have you ever seen a Vietnamese nail shop? <laughs> Billions of dollars of, 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 of revenue, and it all started at Weimar. Of course, this is before the Edmundists came. <laughs> but every time I go to like a nail shop, I, I ask them, hey, have you ever heard of Weimar, California? And most of them are related to somebody who used to stay at Weimar. So anyway... This has nothing to do with my remarks, but I just thought you'd want a little context of Weimar. It was, uh, it was a purchase, the property in 1974, 1978, some, somewhere around there, and it was a place where they wanted to find a place to have a health retreat and kind of bring together an integrated ministry like Dr. Huss was talking about. So they found this place. It had an orchard. It had 15 miles of trails. It had buildings, and the buildings were just covered with pine needles because they hadn't been used for a while. It used to be a county hospital and then something else that was lying there fallow, you might say. And they had about two feet of pine needles, and they just blew them off, and they began starting operations again And some of the very buildings we use now. Now, when I got there in 2006, all right, so... 2006. I've actually been on the campus since 2008. So what, how, how many years is that? I don't know. That's a while. So when I got there, the place was shutting down. The college had shut down, and the uh, New Start program was there, but it was kind of running on empty. And the uh, high school was there, but shaky. And the, the roads looked very dilapidated, and so did all the buildings. And medical missionary work brought the place back. I got there. I'm a nurse and a pastor, a purse, you know. So, And then Dr. Nedley, uh, Neil Nedley, another Michigan folk person, right? I'm from Michigan originally. Uh, Dr. Nedley's from Michigan originally. And then the Seabold clan was out there. They were from Michigan originally. We almost called that place Central Michigan University, or Western Michigan University, because there were so many people from Michigan out there. But what happened was the thing came alive again when Dr. Nedley came out. I realized that they, they actually asked me to be in an administrative role. And I said, <laughs> just because you ask somebody to do something doesn't mean they should do it. I did it for a little bit, but then handed it off to some of these other folks, and God has done great things. But like it says in Testimonies, Volume 6, if you do medical missionary work, see if the life will come back into the church. And that's what happened there. So today we're going to talk about an aspect of that, total community involvement. Let me see if I can use this clicker. Um, let's see, is this the uh, laser printer? Yeah, Weimar. Good, excellent. All right, so let's go on. So this is basically kind of an overview of what we have. We have a new start program there. And we have clinical research that comes out of that. We have a number of published papers going all the way back to the time of Milton Crane where he was looking at neuropathies and how those things can be stopped and reversed through lifestyle. Um, and uh, this is filled up again. Uh, right now, I think there's 22 guests in the, this current program. And then from that we have about 50 baptisms a year. So every week at Weimar, we're doing spiritual hydrotherapy. And Dr. Hess was trying to say that baptism is not, you know, don't focus on it because it makes people feel whatever. Look, I'm going to come back to this idea of baptism because I'm, uh, uh, there is something powerful about it. It's not busy work um, because it actually in the New Testament is the way to access the power of the cross. Did you realize that? You don't access the power of the cross without baptism. So it is essential. I might come back to it with some slides because we do have additional time. So we have about 50 baptisms a year there, and it's a global focus. And then, then we have the Depression Recovery Program, Depression and Anxiety Recovery Program. It's been there since Dr. Nedley and I came there, and Dr. Nedley started this program out of his internal medicine practice where his patients were all depressed because they were in the unit. And that's very depressing. And so he was trying to help them get better. 
Um, then he asked me, he called me on the phone, he goes, Don, what should I do spiritually for these people? They're all wide open. And I said to him, look, you've got to study the book of Daniel with them because every chapter begins with a disappointment and depressing thing and then it ends with an appointment from disappointment to appointment. And that sounds so good that I actually looked at the chapters after that and it's exactly true. Every single chapter does that. And so we'll look at that a little bit more later. Coming out of that, that's a 10-day program, eight of them a year. This is a 18-day program, 12 of them a year. We're shifting this program to uh, 10 days in the future. We're going to try it out because we see such amazing clinical results in just 10 days. Why charge people more money, right? And have them stay longer. Um, so, but we're, we're, we're toying with that. So about 50 baptisms a year out of this, even though there's only eight programs versus 12, there's reasons for that, which I'll cover in my next seminar <laughs> this afternoon. So then uh, Weimar Clinic, this should be now 50 to 60,000 patients a year. We started this as a medical clinic. You guys are doing a medical evangelism clinic after I leave. We started doing that in our neighborhood because we read this little chapter in Ellen White that talked about blueberries. Look for the blueberries nearby. Don't go around the world if you haven't gone across the street. Don't be an Adventist frontier missionary if you can't seem to talk to your neighbors. <laughs> That's what I told my folks. So we went out and we started actually knocking on the doors. They didn't even have any idea who we were. Oh, you guys live in the complex. You live in the compound. You know, they thought we were some kind of cult, you know. <laughs> and um, Yeah, anyway, so this clinic now started out of these medical clinics um, because so many people were interested. We had a dental clinic and a medical clinic, baptized a few people from the community, and then started a couple people came, Dr. St uh, Steffens and Roger Gallant. Now it's called Stallant, those two together. And they, I don't think, I think they employ maybe 60, 100 people, and they see about 50,000 patients a year. And um, this is really something now that has grown into also an outreach. Each of these, now I want to show you something else here. Each of these have a physician minister team. Okay? You can't have a physician without a minister to be effective. All right? I was talking to a doctor about this this morning. Um, it, they work together. So Dr. Nedley and I work here. And then here we've got a number of physicians that work with a chaplain. Now it's uh, Jean Noel um, from New Zealand. Great guy. He was a ministerial director in a union over there. But he came to Weimar just, I don't know, six months ago. And great, uh, great soul winner. And then here, one of my students just graduated last year. Now he's in our master's program. We have two master's degrees at uh, Weimar. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But anyway, he's now in charge of the chaplaincy there. And he actually has, let's see, we baptized 20 people in the last six months and started a branch Sabbath school in a surrounding town um, as well. But these are all, get this idea, they're all physician and minister teams. Does that make sense? So, and then, this, and then we have a church. We didn't have a church when I got there because they were kind of nervous. I don't know. What with the conference thing? So I said, for, forget being nervous of the conference. Let's just join the conference. So I'm actually a, a, a pastor in the conference. Can you believe they actually hired me? This is unusual because California, they don't hire people from, they, 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 they don't say, come here and apply. <laughs> they say, we ask you, you don't ask us, right? But what happened was all of these things started going so well that attendance went up, tithe went up, everything went up. And so they came to me and they said, look, we know you have this arrangement where you've been hired by a conference entity that's, you know, a media ministry and your salary is being run through there, but we'll pay you directly because you're, you're, all this tithe is coming in. Can you say Amen. So I said, okay, great. <laughs> you know, this is more money for us to use, utilize at the Institute for other things. So I'm actually a Northern California Conference pastor. 
Just like Randy Roberts, just like all the other people out there, like faster. No, well, he's not northern. He's southern. I don't know if we let him up there in northern. We, we, we probably would. So, yeah, so this church then, this church integrates all of these things. So they all come to the church. And these are our degrees, natural science. So if you're a pre-med, the very first week you get there, you start rotating through these programs and you're seeing patients right from the very beginning. It's not like you, you know, have to go for four years to some place where they have, you know, other stuff going on that you're confused. No. You're immediately doing medical missionary work with pe people that are modeling that. Dr. Nedley and myself in one team and the others. And you're always, it's not like you say, well, I wonder how that works. No, because it's always like happening right in front of you. Anybody here getting excited besides me? Uh, all right. And the same thing, all these different things. Nursing, do the same thing. My daughter's graduating from nursing uh, this, in six months, Lord willing. Business program, business, Barry. We got business. And they're seeing health care. Uh, theology and religion, the religion degree, the first semester is what's called the health program. It's a four-month intensive that shows you how to do all these things in the, in, the, in the community as well as coaching people and all the stuff he was talking about, integrated. We don't talk about integrating. We're integrated. So then uh, education program, all these people are now hired before they even they almost start because they're so sought after the teachers there. And then psychology, um, undergraduate, and then certificates. And also, I forgot to put on here two master's programs now of wellness and ministry. That'd be kind of like an MDiv, but with, you know, a lunch, <laughs> with the health aspects. And then you have uh, a master's in counseling. Because the counselors out there, they don't know how to integrate the Bible and spirit of prophecy at all, basically. And so this is really focused on that. Okay, so that's kind of what happens. We're accredited, uh, and retroactively, once they accredit us, they go, man, you guys are like the best thing since we've seen in a long time. They allowed our nursing program to start because we had the New Start program integrated with it, nutrition, exercise, water, all those different things. They said, there's 25 schools that wanted to start this year. We said no to them. We say yes to you because we like what you're doing. Hallelujah. That's, uh, that's good news. And then our master's degree uh, folks that are in ministry and whatnot, um, they're working with the Michigan Conference, the Indiana Conference, and several others. I believe uh, all of them are rapidly being integrated. And the pastoral staff of the Adventist Church, largely most of them are in their 60s or 70s, and they're all going to retire soon. And there's nobody really going into that like they should be. Um, and so there's a real crisis, but I think this kind of, of person would be well sought after. Um, coming from this whole thing, pathway to health, total community involvement came out of it as well. I'll talk about that. We don't take any government funding. None of our students graduate with debt. We don't let them. And we raise the resources through worthy student donations. So if you'd like to give money, <laughs> we don't take anything from the government because we simply don't want them telling us what to do. And believe me, they will tell you what to do if you let them. <clears throat> so we don't want that. And we want a student, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, that believes Christ is coming soon and wants to fulfill the gospel commission and digs deeply into the Word of God um, as well. Because that's a little overview of Weimar, just to give you an idea. Um, in the excitement that pervaded Capernaum, that's right. It. There was Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazim. And these were all right in what's called the Evangelical Triangle at the top of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus did most of his ministry in this area of only uh, 14 miles, 11 miles wide by 14 miles deep. Uh, Israel itself is only you know, 70 miles long and 40 miles wide, or maybe a little bit longer than that. It's not a big place. It's a big impact on the media, but not big. And um, so all that ministry was done there. But notice what he says. 
there was danger that the object of his mission would be lost sight of. Is that, is that what Dr. Hess was talking about all morning? Lack of integration, lost sight of the vision and mission. And there was a danger for Jesus. He was not satisfied to attract attention to himself merely as a wonder worker or a healer of physical disease. So, you know, that's not what his big thing was, right? What was his big thing? He was seeking to draw men to him as their savior, while the people were eager to believe they had come as a king to establish an earthly reign, he desired to turn their minds from the earthly to the spiritual. Mere worldly success would interfere with his work. Have you ever seen worldly success interfering with someone's work? This is the case. And so this is the point. And this is the big deal, okay, right here. This slide right here. You're going to take your cell phones out and take a picture. This would be the one to take a picture of. This is one of my biggest discoveries, which was already discovered many years before I discovered it, but I saw it. Okay, don't take a picture of me. Take a picture of the slide, okay, just, just to keep yourselves in good health. So look at this. This is the 2300-day prophecy, but... When I went from working from, oh, just a little bit about myself, um, I went to school here in Michigan. I graduated here with a nursing degree. I worked in the community here for five years as a nurse at what was then called uh, St. Joseph Hospital and Benton Harbor Hospital, and then was called uh, Lakeland, and now it's called something else, some other name now. But I worked for five and a half years here in the, in the ER mostly, paramedic a little bit, ER and whatnot in this community. After that, I got called and became a pastor, but I also still was a nurse. Six doctors called me because I think they wanted a pastor they could tell what to do because I'm a nurse. I'm not sure. But it worked really well. We worked very well together. And those doctors then began working with, uh, working with me at Weimar. Most of them are on my board, so it's like all my church members. Anyway, when I moved from working from Amazing Facts, I worked for Amazing Facts for five and a half years, after being a pastor for 13 and a half years, went to Amazing Facts, and then went to Weimar. When I got to Weimar, I said, man, how am I going to, uh, I need to integrate the prophetic and the medical missionary, because why did, I, why did I think that? Because in Luke chapter 3, Jesus was baptized, Luke chapter 3, verse 21. He was anointed at that time, the time of his baptism. In Acts chapter 10, verse 32, now our speaker this morning said that Luke wrote most of the New Testament. That's not correct. It's Paul. Now, Luke was number two. But Luke, it says in Acts chapter 10, 32, it says he was, how Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. Well, how do you know he had power? Because he went about doing good. And then in chapter 4, it talks about this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to preach good news and set the captives free and all those different things. Remember? And then it ends and it says, and proclaim the acceptable day of the Lord. What is that? That's prophecy. So these two things have to be linked together. How many of you followed me? And flowing out of that, look, if you tell your people to do something because science says it, they might be interested. But if you say science says it plus Bible prophecy says it, I mean, think that's a little more powerful. <laughs> Only one person. That's okay. That's a big group out of the group that we have here with the percentage-wise. That's big, folks. <laughs> okay, so look at this. So I looked at this prophecy. Oh, wait, let me go back. Is there a way to go back? Okay, good. Okay. So this prophecy, you remember the prophecy. How many of you remember the prophecy? There's five key dates. What are the, the key dates? 457, 27, 31, 34, 18, 44. This is the give me five. Give me five prophecy. Look at that person next to you and say, give me five, just to wake yourselves up. Give me five. All right? Give me five. You might want to sit closer together just to keep each other awake in our time of trouble together. So anyway, the <laughs> give me five. This is the paradigm of ministry. 
Let me show it to you. Because each of these things were, were points in a timeline that are very important. 457, rebuild a sanctuary. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Exodus 15, verse 26. If you diligently hearken to my, my, my words, you'll have none of the diseases, right, that I put on the Egyptians. And by the way, if you want to know where the right hand is, look at Exodus chapter 15, and five times in Exodus 15 it says he led them with his right hand. He led them with his right hand. He led them with his right hand to the sanctuary. And the sanctuary is a healing center. And the sanctuary, by the way, is talked about in Exodus, but what's the center of the Pentateuch? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Numbers, Deuteronomy, Pentateuch, five books. Center of the Pentateuch is what? Leviticus chapter 16. And the center of the center of that Pentateuch is about the sanctuary. Did you know that? And what is Leviticus 10 about? 11 about, 12 about, 13 about, 14 about, 15 about? Clean drinks, clean meat, clean homes, clean sexual practices, clean everything. And Paul summarizes it by saying, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do all to the what? He is summarizing the Pentateuch and that pithy statement. And so this is what it means. Create a sanctuary space, and that's your first job. You've got to create a sanctuary space wherever you are. When you're on a plane, you're creating a sanctuary space. You're sitting, you're, this is how I do it on a plane. I'm sitting there and I, I start, because you got headphones on and stuff now. You know, it used to be you could talk to people. Now they got their headphones on and everything else. You got to really be intentional to talk to someone on the plane. So what I do is I go, hmm, wow, hmm, hmm. As I just look at something on my computer or something, I look at the person next to me and I go, this must be their health program, uh, their health problem, okay? I just guess. And I'm, pre I'm usually pretty good because, you know, I've, I've been in this a while. I might say, the person needs to stop smoking because I can smell that. Or the person might have, you know, other issues. And then I just open up a little something or I have a book or I might make a diagram on, on, a, on, a, on a napkin and I'm just going, hmm, wow. And I kind of turn it towards them a little bit. And then I, I don't want to be pushy. So <laughs> then, <laughs> then they say, excuse me. That must be very interesting. I said, oh, yes, it is. And then we get into it. So I'm creating a what? A sanctuary space, which is a place of healing. Can you say amen? So that's what you got to do in your office, in your work, wherever you are. Create a sanctuary space. Number two, what did Jesus then do? There was also times of trouble here. They tried to, you know, the, the wall was built again in trouble sometimes. That's Ezra and Nehemiah. Anytime you try and create a sanctuary space, people are going to fight against it. You think it's going to be easy to put a sanitarium over here? <laughs> no, my friends, there's going to be problems. But you should do it anyway. Are you with me? That's the thing. Because that's what I always say. Look, I could tell you so many stories <laughs> that are almost up to date about how there's always forces fighting against you if you're doing this kind of stuff. And that should make you excited. Oh, man. You know, when, when, I, when I was lost, which is back when I knew Barry, <laughs> I mean, not because of that, but when I was lost, oh, man, nobody cared. You know, now when I said, no, I'm not going to do these things anymore, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to do this and that, they're like, oh, man, are you okay? I'm like, that's what they said, are you okay? Of course I'm okay. But... Uh, when you try and do the right thing, they're worried about you. So what happens Two, 483 years later? Messiah comes into that sanctuary. He's called, and hey, guy, he's called what? The desire of the ages, right? Desire of the nations. We have a book called The Desire of Ages. And what does he do when he comes? He gets baptized. We already talked about that. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news. And proclaim the acceptable day of the Lord. There it is. <laughs> and Acts 10, 37 and 38. I said, I said 10, 32 before. <laughs> he is anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. Well, how do you know he had Holy Spirit and power? Just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And it tells you what he did for three and a half years. And what did he do? 
he went about in the neighborhood, total community involvement, and he went to everybody healing, and what happened as a result? They said, this is the right one, baby, Uh uh-huh. This is the guy. This is him. And they followed him all over the place, right? Now, if I had healed, physically healed people in Weimar, today this auditorium would be full when I'm speaking. But it's obvious that uh, it's not. So there's some problems. But I would tell you that Dr. Nedley and I working together have seen amazing things. We have seen miraculous things. And medical missionary work is supposed to come as close to that as possible. So then what happens? So he enters, he creates a space of healing, and then he does physical acts of healing, and then emotional, mental, spiritual acts of healing on the cross. He dies on the cross. Isaiah 53 talks about a man acquainted with what? Griefs and... Griefs and what? Okay, guys, Isaiah 53, are you with me? It was a man acquainted with griefs and what? Sorrows. What is that? Depression, mental health issues, emotional issues. And he does that. He heals. The, he, 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 what's it say in Isaiah 63, 9? In all their afflictions, he was afflicted. So he enters in with them. And he brings spiritual healing on the cross. Then what happens next? Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What's happening there? The disciples do the same thing. They're healing. They're doing all that in the neighborhood. How many of you are beginning to catch a theme here? And then finally, there's a covenant lawsuit in chapter 6 through 8 of Acts. And he gets up there and they accuse him. They get mad. Why did they get mad at Stephen? He was preaching and what was he doing? Does anyone remember? He was feeding who? The Hebrews and the, and the Hellenists. Which means... He was going beyond his own people group. He was saying, every nation is mine. Every person. The meek shall inherit Palestine. Is that what he said? Did he say that? No, he said, the meek shall inherit the earth. My kingdom is not of this world, else I would fight. I'm going to take care of the people in Israel. I'm going to take care of the people in Gaza. I'm going to take care of the care of the people in Iran and Iraq and United States. I'm taking care of everybody. I'm reaching the world. And they didn't like that. How many of you have seen that people don't like it when you reach an ethnic group they're not happy with at that time? Anyone ever seen this on the news? So they said, we're going to kill you. And they killed him. Another epoch. Look at that. 27, 31, 34. Big, significant thing. How shall we neglect so great a salvation which was first of all spoken to us by the Lord, but then confirmed, Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, by those who heard him. And it says in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, a great number of the priests believed. So even the priests believed. So you have a place of healing, physical healing, emotional, mental, spiritual healing, and then social healing. And this is where this whole idea of total community involvement came to my mind. I said, look, we need to do something in the hood, the neighborhood. Amen? It's prophetic. It's not something you can ignore. It's not something you can say, oh, that was a very boring conversation with Pastor Don. No, it is actually out of Bible prophecy. It's something that you should be known for in your community. How many of you with me? And the whole idea of the Advent movement is to restore that sanctuary message, Daniel 8, 14. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What a powerful witnessing text. How do you use that when you're out witnessing? I use it all the time. I say, hey, look, we want to clean up your yard. Why would you want to do that? Well, it's, uh, it's biblical. <laughs> what? Uh, I don't say that right, right at the beginning. But, you know, his whole idea, he's cleaning up heaven. How many think he's cleaning up heaven right now? And if he can clean up heaven, how many think it's okay if I clean up somebody's yard? Amen? And look, 
He's cleaning up heaven. How many think it's okay if I help clean out somebody's coronary arteries or their lungs? <laughs> what about their cognitive distortions? What about their ethnic tensions? By the way, this is the secret to peace in the Middle East. Did you know that? This is the secret to it. It's actually the, the secret to, the, to, to, to peace everywhere. Even in the NAD, the GC, the LMLP, QRS, and TUZ. Now, all this stuff, this is the whole thing. And then the remnant, that's the three angels' messages. The hour of his judgment has come. That's talking about this whole thing. They're supposed to be doing everything like this again and pointing people again to the sanctuary. This is a sanctuary, this is a sanctuary, and this all happened in the sanctuary. Sanctuary, sanctuary, sanctuary. And by the way, your body's also sanctuary. So, how many think that this... Do you think I should have spent some time showing you the prophetic basis of what I'm talking about? In other words, this seminar is based on Bible prophecy that specifically defines the Advent movement. Okay? Man, I should hear some hallelujahs. This should be more like a Pentecostal meeting at this time. Hallelujah! This is good news. Let's look on now. So, coming out of this then, this whole idea, I preached that sermon right there, and I, I was at, at, at an ASI convention. And I was at this ASI convention, and there's all these rich people there. There's like three or four rich people and a whole bunch of poor people trying to get the money from those rich people. So I just made the observation. I said, you know, there's about five rich people here, three, three to five rich people. I know them all. I've asked them all for money. They've given me nothing, and they're not going to give you anything. Either. That's why they're rich. <laughs> okay? Uh, because I think what's lacking is vision. They, they don't see any vision, maybe. I don't know. But look, let me just give you a vision. So I took that prophecy, and I said, what would happen? What would happen if we filled up a stadium and we just did a clinic and we helped people and we filled up these stadiums and we, filled, we served the underserved? Just kind of like you're going to do here in this medical clinic here. I had this idea and, you know, they took up an offering and I said, what if we filled up stadium after stadium and we actually took Daniel 9 I mean, you know, Daniel 8 and 9 here and we actually created a sanctuary space. We did these different things in it. So they took up an offering, 10000 bucks, and afterwards these two physicians came up to me. They were very excited. They were very what? Kind of like I am right now. And guess what they said? We've got to do this. We've got to do this. Would you come to a meeting? I said, look, things don't get done in meetings. I have too many meetings already. I don't want to come to your meeting. They said, well, we'll feed you lunch. I said, okay, I'm coming to your meeting. So, <laughs> because if, if there's some eating, I'm going to the meeting, okay? And so I go to the meeting, and then they start fighting. Oh, it, was, it won't happen. It won't this. I was like, come on, guys, you're giving me indigestion. I'm leaving. And then, make a long story longer, it actually happened. And so we, the next year in San Francisco, they call it was Bridges to Hell. Look at this. This is the armory. It started to all fill up all these people. There were 3,000 people, 4,000 people that went through that clinic. They were all around this building in San Francisco. This one guy says to me, hey, are you the reason that this is happening? I said, why are you talking to me? There's all kinds of people here. Uh, do I look like some, the reason for anything? I'm not the reason for anything. I've only got four kids, and that's the only thing I have the reason for. And he goes, look, Look, you just look like, you, you look like you have something to do with this. <laughs> I was like, how does this guy doesn't even know me? And he goes, don't you realize this is a place of darkness? And, and it really was. San Francisco is a place, a place of darkness in many ways. And so we start there, and who knows what's going to happen. Pretty soon there's people lined up. And uh, a couple days later this guy comes back to me. You know what? We had like, I can't remember how many thousand people went through, but we wanted to feed them all, and we're going to feed them good food, so we, we, we fed them these burritos made out of hummus and veggies or something. There was only one burrito left. I can say amen to that, and I ate it. So one burrito left. It was like God orchestrated everything. So that guy comes up to me again. He sees me. And at the end of the, <laughs> the last day, I said, let's sing Amazing Grace at 12 o'clock. Amazing Grace. We all start singing Amazing Grace. And he goes, I knew it. 
it's you. And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> he said, this was a place of darkness, but you guys turned it into a place of light. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I was impressed at that time because of my own history. I said to him, I said, is your dad a minister of the gospel? He goes, how did you know that? I said, I had no idea. But I know I was lost at one point, and my dad was a minister of the gospel. And he goes, he goes, well, why did you say that? I said, I think you should be about your father's business. He got ashen. He goes, he started to cry. And he says, can I go with you to the next town that you do this in? That's, I felt like Jesus at that moment. I want to follow you to the next town. We had five or six ministers of other denominations that said that very day when they saw what we did. How can I become an Adventist minister? So, um, oh, by the way, that one time, $10,000 came in for the offering. That one time, the next year when we had everybody together, 700 of us working together, $268,000 came in. Of course, some people tried to take it. You know, there's always fights when there's money. But uh, can you say hallelujah? hallelujah? If it's God's will, it's God's bill. And all those cities, <laughs> that's what happened. And, and then uh, several churches planted out of the Alamo Dome just before the, the, the general conference. Um, and all my students went with me to work together there. I'm telling you, that was an amazing experience. And um, you remember what he was saying this morning and last night? These are all ministers, and I should have had all the physicians standing around them. But ministers and physicians were working together, and this was like the worst evil reversed. You know how many news agencies came out? There were 28 networks there from around the world. Amen. I went to visit my relatives who are on the left coast, and I'm going down to visit them, and they're not Adventists. I went to their house, and they said, we knew you were here. I said, what are you talking about? They said, we watched the news, and we thought you had something to do with this. <laughs> Can you say amen? How many want to be known for this kind of stuff? Mm-hmm. Not a serial killer, but a serial eating Adventist. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Worst evil reversed. And baptisms. Oh, by the way, coming out of this, in, uh, in, in my health work, you know, working with all these different things, one of the big things I wanted to mention to you that I for, don't forget is this. I think the real thing that's needed is actually baptism. Look at this. Um, I speak to our leading brethren. Who was this written to? This was written about 1905. Who, who do you think this was written to? To our ministers and especially our physicians. Who was the leading physician in 1905, 1903? Kellogg. Who was the leading brethren? A.G. Daniels. And to our ministers. Just as long as you allow pride to dwell in your hearts, as long as you, so long will you lack what? Power in your work. Where there's pride, there's no what? Power. For years, a wrong spirit has been cherished, a spirit of pride, a desire for preeminence. This is the minister wants to be higher than the doctor. The doctor wants to be higher than the minister. This is why I call ourselves we mar. Okay. All right. <laughs> In this Satan is served. God is dishonored. The Lord calls for a decided reformation. And when a soul is truly reconverted, let him be what? Rebaptize, and when a soul is truly reconverted, let him renew his covenant with God, and God will renew his covenant with him. This is exactly what Ellen White said to A.G. Daniels. A.G. Daniels was not listening to what she had to say, and she went to visit him, or he went to visit her in Elmshaven, and she said, I don't want to visit with you. She sent her messenger down. No, I don't. This is the general conference president. Hello, um, I'm just here dropping in. Uh, don't want to talk to you. Why not? Because you're not listening to my messages. What was the message? to integrate medical missionary work together and to do evangelism in an integrated fashion. And she said, I don't even want to talk to you. 
He goes home, and he goes, this cut me very hard. I thought I had been converted. <laughs> but then I realized I need to be reconverted. I don't know if he ever got rebaptized, and I know Kellogg didn't, because it's hard. But guess what? When I read this, I realized in my life, <laughs> there's some stuff. I mean, I need to be rebaptized myself. So I got rebaptized in 2017. I got rebaptized. Dr. Nelly got rebaptized. Another couple of our physicians got baptized. Our chaplains got baptized, all because of this quote as we were studying it. And you know what? An avalanche of power came into our ministry. And out of that is how TCI began to be spawned, total community involvement. Let me explain to you why. First of all, the clinic came out of it. We started that clinic. Remember that circle I showed you the clinic? Because it got so big. Then I got a call to be a conference president. I actually won the election. They started calling me and asking me questions like I'm the president. <laughs> and I was like walking around the house like I'm a president, you know. <laughs> and my wife was like, <laughs> I, don't like I don't like the new you. And she goes, and I don't even know if it would be good for our kids. And I was like, okay, I better study again. I'm studying again before I accept this call. I rejected the call to be a conference president because of many reasons, one of which was, um, well, I read, I read, I read, I just read the sources again, and this is what I came up with. I found these quotes. Look at this quote. There's a grand work to be done in, re in relieving suffering humanity through the labors of students who receive an education and training to become efficient medical missionaries. This is exactly what he's saying he wants done here. He wants all the students from Andrews over here. <laughs> no, maybe not that, but by the way, I think that would be a great thing. This is what we do at Weimar all the time. So I read this. People living in many cities may become acquainted with the truths of the third angel's message. That's what I'm going to talk about on Sabbath. <laughs> Consecrated leaders and teachers of experience should go out with these young workers. That's what I do every week. At first, giving them instruction on how to labor. Thus, opportunity will be found for conversion and explaining the scriptures, for singing Bible songs, for praying with the family. There are many to whom such labor of this would prove a blessing. So I took this. It says, go out and sing. How many of you notice that I like to sing? So I took some students out with me. I said, hey, it says, it says to sing to the neighbors. <laughs> so we go to the neighbors. They said, what are you going to do? I said, it's not what I'm going to do. It's what we're going to do. We're going to sing to that neighbor right there. They're going, well, they don't even know we're coming. I said, I know. That might terrify them if they did. So as soon as they open the door, let's just sing like a Christmas song. Like, you know, even though it's the summer, <laughs> let's cool things down because they're probably hot. So they open the door and we start to sing. And they go, excuse me. This is beautiful. How, uh, how do we, uh, uh, why are we the recipients of this? I said, well, you know, someone, someone told us to come. Well, who told you? I said, well, you, you probably don't know them. Uh, we won't even mention them. Uh, but no, we want to know. Who is it? I said, well, this is a lady called Ellen. Ellen? Do we know Ellen? I said, I don't know. What's your last name? White. Ellen White. Well, does she live near here? I said, no. She does not live. She does not live near here. And then my students were laughing, right? They're laughing. But then she goes, Well, I, I want to know this person. I said, You really should get to know her. But there's another time for that. Who do you think we should sing for next? And she got this big grin. Those people right there. I said, Why do you want to sing for them? She said, they're not nice. Well, I said, should we tell them that you sent us? No, 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 no. Tell them that Ellen sent you. <laughs> Can you say amen? So we were starting to put things together in the hood, the neighborhood. We began singing. This became a singing group. They have CDs and everything. But this all started out of this quote. Let me just show you. If you act, actually God's will for your life has already been written down. Did you know that? You just have to look and read it. It's already there. Don't stress, oh, what do I do next? It's already there. Just read it. So I'm reading that, that quote. So what's it say? Students should be out with consecrated leaders and teachers. That's what Dr. Nelly and I, and all, we're doing this all the time with people. Second, it is necessary to their, yes? Dr. Donner, where is that? Uh, did I not have the citation up there? Loma Linda Messages which I think, uh, yes, they're right out there in Loma Linda. Okay, so number two, 
<laughs> Make a space in the schedule for this. Look at this. It is necessary. It is what's that say? To their complete education that students be given time to do acrobatics. What? <laughs> And spiritual acrobatics, missionary work, time to become acquainted with the spiritual needs of the families and the community around them. Adjust classes don't address the outreach, in other words. They should be not so loaded down with studies that they have no time to use the knowledge they've acquired. We're not talking GMAT, MCAT, LSAT. We're, we're talking this is the priority, not NCLEX, double helix. No, it's put this as the priority. E, yeah. So I read this. They should be encouraged to make earnest missionary effort for those in error, becoming acquainted with them and talking to them the truth. Become acquainted first. Now that got my attention. Next. Whenever possible, students during the school year. Now, this is not something like, we're going to go on our break. We're going to do a youth rush. It's going to fit into our schedule, not God's schedule. We have our schedule, and God must fit into our schedule because God, <laughs> he's like a little pod, the God pod. No, we, we do it all the time. I'm reading this. I'm getting really convicted. They should do missionary work in the surrounding towns and villages. They can form themselves into bands to do Christian help work. Students should take a broad view of their present, not when they graduate, obligations, to God. The problem when I went to school was, uh, well, if then, if you graduate, if when you do that, for me it was a big question, if you graduate at all, then you do something. No, 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 no. The whole idea is now as. Now. Let's say that together. Look at the person next to you and say, now as. No, everybody's got to do this. Look at that person. Look at them. Say, now as. Okay, you come over, you, you, you slipped away from the flock, come up. Now as. Now as. That's our big watch. It's not like, if, when. Well, just when I get through studying for my test, then I'll do that. No, because you know what? If you do that, what, what, what does that mean when you do that? Something else is your priority. Hello? Something else is your priority. And the more you do that, the more damaging it is. And we have students that go through school, oh, well, they're not old enough to do that. Oh, well, they're not old enough to do that. And then when they get old enough to do that, they don't want to do that because they never did that because they never knew about that because that's not something they did. So this really convicted me. Can you see that I was getting convicted? I, was, I had the opportunity to be a conference president, and I said, look, I'm going to do this in the conference. I'm, I'll be in charge and large. And then I read this one. The teachers and students in our schools need the divine touch. How many think that's true? God to do much more for them than he has done because in the past his way has been restricted. If a missionary spirit is encouraged, even if it takes some hours from the program of regular study, much of heaven's blessings will be given provided there is more faith, more spiritual zeal, more of a realization of what God will do. How many can see that those four quotes are fairly interesting? So those four quotes were working on me like the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and they were like boom, 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 and I was like, man, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to become a conference president, or I'll stay at Weimar. If they decide to do this, I'm going to stay because this is what God wants done at, at Weimar. So I talked to Dr. Nedley and the associates there, and I said, look, I'm really feeling drawn to the president. I mean, look at me. I look like a president. But I, I have this vision also for here because I think we're kind of at a juncture where we're getting too successful and we're losing a sense of our mission because we're focusing on, and by the way, we accomplished all those things we were focusing on then, accreditation and everything else. But is that really our priority mission work? And I said, look, I'll stay here if you guys dedicate at least one day a week to do this with all the students and staff. I thought, they're going to say goodbye, hit the road, Jack, 
Don't you come back no more, no more. I don't know if you know that song, but it was a, it's not in the hymn book. So anyway, so <laughs> have a new plan, Stan. So <laughs> no, uh, and that's what I thought they were going to say. But amazingly, they said, let's do it. I was like, what do you mean let's do it? And so I called them up. I called up the union president and I said, Look, I'm not coming. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to be a conference president. I'm doing this. He goes, excuse me? He goes, not, this is a call from God to the, and I was like, well, God also showed me this stuff, and I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry, but no. So I stayed, and that's what happened. Now, that I would say, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. It's not me, but I think this is probably one of the defining marks of Weimar University now. Now, we're not like Jesus yet. Jesus went about doing good every day. We have one day, even just a half a day. And I tell people there, I said, look, 10% to Jesus, I surrender. No, it's supposed to be all to Jesus, I surrender. But we at least are, we're, we're at least doing a tithe, right? I surrender most. So um, we went public with TCI, and we got a leader, Narlin Edwards, a great Bible worker, now he's starting his own lifestyle center in Kentucky. We went on 3ABN. Instead of talking about my goals as a new conference president, we talked about our goals with TCI. And then Elder Wilson came. He was overjoyed. We said total community involvement. He gave us some money from the general conference, and he said, I really like that. Look, this is integration, integration, integration of the general conference president, of the union president, of the conference president, and of all kinds of people coming together now behind medical missionary work. The worst evil was being reversed with the hope of what's happening. So then what happens? We have these shirts. The shirts are very simple shirts. They say on the back of the shirt, do you need help? Question mark. And that's all we do. That's the training. <laughs> There's no seminars that take a long time. Do you need help? Can you wear a shirt? And can you go and ask someone what they need help with? What they say, you may not be able to do, but do whatever you can close to what they say. How many think that sounds good? And do that for about four or five hours every week. And, and this is what we did. Pretty soon, it was amazing. I remember the first, you mind if I tell you a couple stories? So one, I go out the first time, very first time, I'm like, I'm nervous, because like, like I just got all the ducks, you know, heading down the road here, and I'm like, they're not going to lay any eggs, I don't know what's going to happen. So I go to the very first house, I say to this guy, hey, look, notice there's some stuff in your yard, it might be cleaned up, we'd like to clean that up. He goes, why are you doing this? I said, well, let me just tell you. We have a disease, all the students and staff over there, it's a very sick disease. What is it? Well, it starts with an L. It's, 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 uh, you probably haven't heard of it before. It's called Laodiceaitis. Laodiceaitis, it's an inflammation of the brain. And we, there's a bunch of very selfish kids over there, self-focused. And faculty, in fact, me, myself, I'm, oh, I've got real problems. And if we don't help people, we're going to die. That's what they told us. The doctor told us, if you don't help people, you are going to die. So it's a matter of life and death for us, and it might help you. He goes, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. But yeah, sure, you can help. Fine. So we clean up his yard. The ladies go and they clean up his house inside. The, 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 the lady was sick. And we get through, and the guy, he's just, he says, what do you do at the university? And one guy goes, well, I'm a medical doctor. I just, I just uh, came out today to come with the pastor. What? You could have been seeing patients all day and making money? Man, that's a lot of pay you missed. He goes, well, just you saying that paid me all I need, brother. And then what do you do? Well, I'm a professor of, you know, neuroscience at the Institute. What? And you were cleaning up pine needles? Yeah. And this guy, he says, I can't believe it. And then he goes, I said, look, um, introduce all the students, what their majors were. I said, we want to sing for you and pray for you, sing a song and pray, but anything else we could do to help you? This is the very first person. Okay, how many of you are getting an idea of what total community involvement is? 
You go out and you just say, do you need help? And you wear kind of wild shirts. That's it. So we get through, and I say, anything else? And he goes, yeah, I do have a request. What is it? You know this lady that's living with me? It looks like my wife. She's not my wife. She's, we've never gotten married. Is there anybody at the institute that could marry us? And the students go, he can, he can. They all point at me. He goes, are you a minister or something? I said, I am certainly the sinister minister of the frozen chosen of the church over the street. And he goes, would you, bap- would you, would, would you uh, marry us? I said, I would love to. We had a wedding in the classroom. They made a cake. The choir sang. Can you say hallelujah? This is integration into the community. And then he said to us, I said, uh, I said, do you guys go to church anywhere? He goes, no, that's something else. We've never been baptized. Could anyone baptize us? And, and could we, any church? You? Hallelujah. Amen. That's the first visit. It wasn't some big, complicated study of the 2300 days, but it was the 2300 days because thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's cleaning up heaven. We cleaned up the guy's house. That's the 2300 day. And the more training you get, the more dangerous it is because you start getting proud. But the more training you get, the more doors you can open, the more things you can clean up. Well, let me, work, let me work on that spinal stenosis. Let me work on that, you know, that neoplasm in your arm. Let me work on that, you know, trichobezoar in your throat. Let me, <laughs> that's a furball. <laughs> let, me, let me, whatever it is, let me take that bug out of your ear. One of my favorite things in the year. So they started re- writing about it in the newspaper. The mayor came. It started going all over the place. Now, one of my faculty members, I can remember, he said to me, first time we went out, he goes, I got a PhD in this. I spent years and all this stuff, and you want me to go out and do what? I said, clean some toilets, brother. He's like, I'm not doing it. I said, okay, blessing will be ours for the toilet cleaning. So we will go out. And we get, and you know what? That day we went, not this guy's house, but another guy's house. This, by the way, is our new star chaplain. He goes out with us. This lady ended up joining the church. Another guy, all these people, now are church members. Anyway, so uh, this is not rocket science. You don't have to like get an amazing fact study guard, get a, it is written or it is smitten or quiet hour or faith or yesterday or whatever. You, you can get whatever. It's the simplest way to witness. Are you with me? Probably has more impact. So anyway, I go out and I'm at this, at this house and this lady's a pharmacist. I didn't know that at the time. But I go up to her house and I see this wood Pretty, you know, semi-nice neighborhood, pretty nice. And I say, hey, look, we need some help. We've got, our, our kids are sick. You know, they, they're self-focused and they're all rich and their parents can afford to send them here and, or someone can, I don't know who is. And, uh, you know, education is not costly, it's priceless. And, and they're here and somehow they're there. I don't know how they get there, but they're being damaged because they're not helping people. And we need to get them out. And the faculty too, same thing. They're, they're a wreck. And I'm representing, I'm, I'm representing them. I'm a wreck too. And so we need to help you. She goes, the boy says, that's him. It's him. And I was like, okay, good. He understands I'm a him. That's good. In this day and age, it's good to understand genders. So, um, but what's he saying? Why is he saying this? He says, you know what? And the lady says, let me talk to you. So uh, we, we start working there. And she goes, I want to talk to you a little bit later. Later, she pulls me over. She says, you know, my, my boy and I, we're not, we're not spiritual. Well, we're kind of spiritual. We're not religious at all, but... And we don't really pray or anything, but my boy last night, he said to me, Mom, what what do we have to lose? Why don't we just pray? I don't even know how he learned about praying. He says, let's just pray because his father is in a treatment program and he has problems with alcoholism and this has been going on. So he prayed last night that someone would come and help us with all this yard work because Dad's not here. On the next day, you came. And you actually asked to do the very things that he prayed about. And she said, who are you? And how did you know? I said, 
I didn't know. I felt impressed. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I felt impressed that I should reach out to you because that person right over there is a member of my church and he needs help knowing how to reach out to people and he's not reaching his neighbors. So I said, I'm going to go reach his neighbors for him. <laughs> That's the honest truth, lady. Let me introduce you to him and this and that. And that boy became a believer that day. But then when I went back and told the faculty member what they missed out on, I said, let me tell you what happened today. I told him what happened. And the faculty member in his office began to cry. He said, I made a big mistake. I need to be going out every week. Look, you, you, you don't need any preparation. It's already prepared for you. And I remember years ago I lived in this community, and Mark Finley, we were doing a campaign in Niles, and he goes, don't assume that just because you live in Berrien Springs they know about the Adventist church. And you know what? I found that to be true. I just knock on the next door neighbor's house. They, they didn't really know too much at all. Look for the blueberries that are nearest you. It's amazing. So they come, they go out, and then we come back, and every, we have testimony time where they share what happened. And this is really what happens. Take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save thyself and them that hear thee. In other words, the reason we do medical missionary work is not because everyone needs help in the community, but because you're sick. Okay, you're sick. That's the reason you need to go out. If you don't go out, you're going to die from Laodiceitis. You have got a bad sin condition. It's told about prophetically. You're rich and increased with goods. You think you have need of nothing, but you're wretched, poor, pitiful, and blind. That's pretty bad. And I stand at the door and knock. Since I'm knocking, maybe you should do some door knocking too. Now let me show you what happened to the students. We have what's called institutional research. We have to do this for accreditation. You've got to research yourself and then research yourself and then research what you researched. And so we just we embrace it. But this is what happened. These are some of the testimonies. Taking my focus off my own problems has indeed helped me gain victory over them. Putting my attention on the needs of others, my own problems seem smaller and conquerable. What is the biggest crisis in, in tertiary education today? It's mental health issues, depression, suicide, anxiety on college campuses. It is doing in most college campuses and universities because they cater to the people that come and try and coddle them, and they don't have them doing meaningful things. So they get depressed. I got depressed when I was on your hall. I remember coming to your, your, your hall, not because of you again. And I came one night, and I told this guy, he was my RA, I said, look, I'm depressed, and this and that, because I had a girlfriend. She broke up with me like all the girlfriends did. They were very wise. But um, I was depressed, and because I was focusing on the wrong thing. I, I mean, it's okay to get married. you got to get hats and masks and dispatch at the end. But it was okay at some point, but not then it wasn't. And you get all confused if you don't have a focus on doing God's business. And this, is, this happens again and again. Look at this next one. Going out and ministering to others not only took up literal time in our week, but also in our minds. <laughs> and allowed me to personally not focus on my own life and its concerns, but on those of others. Hallelujah. You see this quote from Ellen White? Strength to resist evil is best gained by what? Aggressive service. Here's another one. Having less time to focus on self allowed me to desire a closer relationship with Christ and set me in a spiritual sort of high that curved my tendency to sin. Would you like to have victory over sin? Or do you believe that's not possible? It's certainly not if you're not helping others. Wow. You know, faculty members said the same thing. You have an entire space of time for me to go out a block where I can actually give Bible studies? I can actually do stuff in the community? Yes. Do people always try and encroach on this? All the time. Is it a struggle to keep the focus? Absolutely. But is it worth it? If you value your mental health, Pretty soon, conference 
Okay, this is integration. University presidents all from Latin America came. These are all university presidents, and they all said, we want to do this in our universities. Tell us how to do this. I was embarrassed because my, my presentation is what I just gave you. It's pretty simple. Find some shirts that say need help. I mean, I mean I, it's embarrassing. It's simple remedies, right? Very embarrassing to say, okay, uh, well, let me just. But then we decided this is not enough. Our TCI groups, they need to be doing midweek service in the neighborhoods. Don't come back for midweek service here. Stay out there. Get a house, get a hall, and have people invited now in those various neighborhoods. We have 15 neighborhoods, and now they're in charge. I said, look, if I go to the neighborhood and I see a cat on your street, I want to know that you know the cat's name. If I see a pet snake, I want to know the snake's name. You should know everything about that place. You need to be in the hood and know the people because most of our mission work is what? Uh, we went to Mexico and we helped the people build a church and we don't know their names. We do know we got sick and then we came back. <laughs> okay, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I don't want to be down on it too much. But it's in your time schedule. It's another country. You're not really engaging totally with the people for very long. You don't really know them. They don't know you. And this is where this hit me. I was like, this the major problem in the church is most people don't know anybody outside the church at all. They don't know. Now I know everybody in my neighborhood. I know their dogs' names. I know all about them. When I go by, I don't say, hey. I go, Barney, how's Fido doing? How many think this might be the way to win souls? So you become indispensable in their lives because they're indispensable in your life. It's not a one-way street, folks. You need the help I'm talking about. If you go out there thinking, oh, I'm, I'm helping. I'm going to heal a hurting world. That's me. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> They're not interested in you. They might heal you with a little boot to the head, as they said back in the day. So every place. Now we have branch Sabbath school starting where there's little congregations meeting on Sabbath afternoons. These are not mandated. These are facilitated. And now the students are leading those. They're leading them and the faculty. Amen? One soul saved to live throughout the ages of eternity to praise God and the Lamb is more valued than millions of money. Okay, I'm going to school for money. Well, this is, that shoots that out, one soul. One soul is worth more than all the gold and silver that could be heaped upon the earth. Ooh. What? One soul for whom Christ died is worth more than the whole world. Oh, oh. Hmm. One soul saved in the kingdom of God is worth more than 10,000 worlds like this one. One soul is of what? So the value of a soul. Are you beginning to see what prophetic health is all about? Did I talk to you about this already? <laughs> Create a what? Enter that place of healing with what? Physical acts of help, Christian help, work, and everything else. Get close to people. What? Because you went on the, you went on the, you pick up your, you, you picked up your what? And followed Jesus' example. And you get everywhere where? In the hood. The neighborhood. And you help people. And that's what you do. Because you're an Adventist, not a bad Adventist, not a sad Adventist, a glad Adventist. And do you have a good time doing it? <laughs> you have a great time doing it. I'm telling you what, we've had so many great experiences. I mean, I could tell you all kinds of stories. I remember when one guy, his house was a total... This is what I told all my groups. Find the worst-looking house and start there. The worst. And I found this house, and man, it was a disaster. 
I should have put some pictures up here. It was a disaster. I went and I said, hey, look, we want to clean your house up. So we cleaned the house up. We took like five stuff, five, five trailers full to the dump. And we come back. <laughs> and uh, he goes, I can't believe you, you did this. He goes, you know, I, I, I wanted to do this, but I, I hurt my leg two years ago. And I, he had a big brace on. I've been unable to walk, and I felt more and more embarrassed each time. But the fact that you guys did this. And then there were these people driving by, and they were all honking because they were so happy the place was getting cleaned up. One lady pulls over, and she goes, what, what, why did you, who are you guys? Do you have these shirts on? Do you have a company? I said, oh, yeah, we got a company. <laughs> we certainly do, my friend. Yeah called Total Community Involvement. We're from Weimar University. She goes, well, I want to give a donation. Can I hire you? I said, no, we don't, we, no, no, no. You'd mess us up. Don't hire us. Well, I want to give a donation. I said, well, I, I would too if I were you. And she gave us a big donation, like 2,500 bucks. You know, one of the things, in, in the book Ministry of Healing, which is a great book we heard about this morning, Ministry to the rich has a whole chapter. You know what it says? Go to the rich people and tell them what you're doing for the poor and ask them to help. And you know what? We go and tell people. Just like true in-gathering. Not the fake in-gathering when I was growing up of pictures of someone else did. We have pictures of what we did in our community for our neighborhood. And we tell people, and guess what? They support us. And now I want to talk about something that Dr. Hess talked about. You see, baptism is a big part of this whole thing. In fact, it's a crucial part. You make a sanctuary and then you get baptized. You create a space and then you get baptized. And then you lead others to get baptized. Because you get baptized into Jesus. So let me show you this. What you really need in this ministry is the power of the cross. How many think the power of the cross? It was right in the center of my diagram, if you notice that. What does it say in the Bible about the power of the cross? It can wash us from our sins. How many of you have some sins that you need washed away? If you didn't raise your hand, you just already have one right there. Number two, the power of his righteousness, to have his righteousness. How many need that? The power to deliver you from darkness. The power to disarm principalities and authorities. The power to draw the entire universe. I, when I be lifted up, will draw all. The power for peace of mind and body. The power to end alienation and hostility. The power over death and the fear of death. The power to live a righteous life. The power to walk in newness of life. The power to live the life of Christ. The power to resist the world. How many of you are interested in any of that power? So that's the cross. That's the summary. Now, how do you access it? You look at it. You boast about it. You share your testimony concerning its power. But notice this. It's crucial. We are baptized into the power. What's it say in Romans 6, 3 through 6? So we continue in sin? God forbid. How should we? Live any longer in it. Do you not know that as many of you are baptized into Christ, are baptized into his death, his burial, his resurrection, I am crucified with Christ, therefore I'm not going to live. How many think we need baptism? It's not busy work. Baptism is not something that you just prepare for. It is something that prepares you. We don't talk about that part of it enough. That's what it says in Acts chapter 10, 37 and 38. What does it say? He was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power and went about doing good. How was he anointed? When was he anointed? At the time of his? At the time of his? And he was resurrected with power and he went about doing what? And was his baptism meaningless, busy work? It was essential right? 
We present our members as being alive from the dead, instruments of righteousness, and we take up his cross daily and follow him. Nothing is more exciting than total community involvement. And then I want to take a couple questions here. Then see people come with you on the mission. As soon as we would help people, many times they'd say, can we go with you next week? And suddenly I've got all these non-members coming with me with chainsaws and forks and pitchforks and this and that, and they're out helping. Because what they were one to, they want to do. What they're one through, they want to do. You want acrobats in your church and midgets doing trick shows and stuff? Then do that. I have nothing against it. But how many think there might be a bigger need for this kind of stuff? Right? That's the first guy from the first house I told you about. He's now a member. Faithfully comes every week. (laughs) This is another guy met on TCI. We have a rock called Moses Rock. And we baptize people there almost every week. <laughs> this is another guy, Wade. This guy is a piece of work. He's, he's hilarious. He's always there. He's a deacon now. And then we had all kinds of people get baptized from the students that year. This is my daughter getting baptized. She's 20, 21 years old there. She went on a mission trip when she was younger, hit her head, had a closed head injury. And she said, how could God let me get a closed head injury on a mission trip? And she said, I'm not going to follow God anymore. She got depressed. She thought about ending her life. I was really worried about her. Then she got involved in total community involvement. And then I invited Louis Torres to come and do a series at the end of the year. He came. And she came forward for the appeal. And then I went to see, I, I, I went up there. I was so excited. She goes, Dad, I'm just getting baptized because of you. And I was like, well, that's not good enough. And Louis Torres goes, zip the lip for a minute. You get your robe. Let me talk to your dad. He says to me, Pastor McIntosh, <laughs> the Bible says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long. Hold on. She is trying to keep one of the commandments, and you're trying to talk her out of that being a good reason to get baptized? <laughs> that was the testing truth for her, that commandment. And I was like, and that's why you're the evangelist, and I'm the pastor. But it gave me no more joy to see my daughter get baptized. But more joy than that, to, to have her come back and say, guess what? The people I'm working with today, she finally took a great controversy from me. I'm talking with her about God. You know, she's going to graduate from nursing school. That's going to be a proud day. But more, I'm more happy about this, I'll be honest than that, that she is interested in totally sharing Christ and being involved in that. That's it. Any questions about total community involvement? How many think it's something that is too complicated for you to even wrap your head around? Now, it's very simple. And don't think, oh, you know what? I have a cane. I can't walk. One of my students had only a cane. He was blind in one eye. He's now died from a brain tumor. But he knew he was dying. Guess what he did? He says, I'm going on total community involvement. He's knocking on people's doors with his cane. You know what he said to them? What he got there? He goes, look, I'm dying, but I want to be helping people while I'm dying. I wonder if I could help you with something and my friends. You know how many people came to church from that guy witnessing? About 15. Well, I don't think, oh, I don't have what it takes. The weaker you are, the stronger you are when it comes to this. All right. Let me, uh, any questions, comments, concerns? No questions? Yeah, Barry. Well, I'm actually having 10 bucks at my bar, cleansing of cows. 
<laughs> he wants 10 bucks, guys. If you guys buy my books, I'll have the money to pay, I'll pay him the money. <laughs> Oh, do we have insurance? No, you, you take insurance from your, from your credit card claims. It's the same thing you take government money. You take commercial insurance at this point. Yeah. The, the, the clinic it rents uh, leases from us, and it, they're a rural health clinic from the state of California. And so they, they just lease from us. Um, I don't think they, I don't know what they do with all that. I'd have to ask them. Um, so we have several of our ministries that actually are leasing space from us, or a couple of medical clinics, just like you guys are wanting to start here. Dr. Nelly has a practice, and then you have all those people doing the, the other. Um, it does help our revenue, you know, because they rent our spaces and stuff. But we take no government funding when it comes to the educational piece. Um, some people might say, well, you have a 501c3. That's government. That's true. If they took that away, that could, that could cause some real problems, but they haven't done that yet. Uh, but usually with 501c3s, they're not trying to be intrusively tell you what to do with what you're, what's happening that I've ever heard of. Any, and by the way, this is a big thing. Look, you think that doesn't make any difference uh, with the agenda of the government these days? They totally weaponize that funding even now, and it has an influence on campus, a campus near you. And campus is not so near you. Many campuses. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, TMI, we didn't like that. It seemed like too much information. So we called ourselves total community involvement instead. Uh, by the way, we make up a little card that has a survey card. I didn't, I should have brought one as an example to you. Um, it's just a basic card. But usually with these cards, when we go out in the neighborhood, we do those cards just because we're interested in the Bible study. And we never follow through on the other things. But we actually follow through on the other things on the card. And that's how we build the relationships with people. Just, would you like help with your yard work? Would you have help with this or that? Then we have a bunch of health issues. We do have a Bible study opportunity there and different things. But we put all those things there and then you know, follow through. We, they've, they've done, done all kinds of stuff, you know. By the way, we've had a number of funerals, too. We don't advertise that on the card, but uh, just last week we had a funeral of a guy. This, this lady, her husband was a minister who was a bad minister, and so she gave up on God and everything else, but she needed help moving, and I found out, and we went to help her, she, didn't, she wouldn't talk to me, but she talked to the students. Because, of course, I'm a minister, and I, I triggered her. Over the years, she came closer. And closer. Five years ago, I met her first. Then she got a boyfriend. The boyfriend, after she met him, six months later, had pancreatic cancer that developed, and then he just died um, in, um, just several weeks ago. But the family was so touched, and she was so touched by how we had ministered to them all those years that she introduced him before he died. He came over. He, got, he was too weak to get baptized, but he got anointed. He gave his heart to Jesus, and he knew everybody in the community. And not this last Sabbath, but the Sabbath before, we had a funeral for him or a memorial service. And there was 300 people in our church, and they were all people we didn't know. None of our church members were really there except for maybe four or five. The whole church was filled and they all came to me afterwards, you know, tell me about this. Tell me about your church. Tell me about this. Tell me. I always wondered about this. So we've had, let's see, I've had three funerals. I've had four weddings, all coming out of going into the neighborhood. And, and you can tell people about your clinic. You can tell people about your church. You can tell people about everything, right? And it's not that difficult. You don't have to go to Loma Linda. You don't have to graduate from Andrews to do this. You, you just have to be able to breathe and help people with something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, uh, when I was in this church, I only had four members. One of them was 97, and the others were younger. And I, I asked them to help me with something like this, and they all said no, except the 97-year-old. So she went out with me door to door. And that made the 70-year-olds feel guilty, so they went out. And that church grew from three members to 60 members. And it was pretty interesting going door to door with a 97-year-old. She'd knock on the door and she said, I know you're in there with her cane. They came out and they said, What's your name? And she said, They said her name, Look, I knew your grand, I, I knew your, your, your mother, I knew your grandmother, and, I, and, and she would tell them all this stuff. And they were like, And she was a great witness. And then she opened up her home with hospitality. She's 97. So that was three members and grew to 60. They went back down to 14 members because they all moved away and I had to start over again. But it was one of those small towns. Now, it works. You know what? Helping people works. Doesn't matter where. Could you see it working along with a doctor's office? Of course. With a church? Of course. Let me pray for you guys. Father in heaven, thank you for our time together. The Lord, use what I said in some way to encourage someone to take whatever the next step is in fulfilling their prophetic role of creating a sanctuary space, entering with physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, social acts of healing. In Christ's name, amen. Am I out of time? <laughs>